Well, the noon hour is upon us, which means it's time for another installment of Bites and Bits of History here at the Mahoning Valley Historical Society. My name is Bill Lawson. I'm Executive Director of the Historical Society, and we're very happy to have you here today in this remote form of Bites and Bits of History. This program is sponsored by the John and Loretta Hines Foundation, who were generous contributors to the campaign for the Tyler Mahoning Valley History Center, and we appreciate their generosity and support of the Mahoning Valley Historical Society. We have a very special program today. Actually, we could say that this is the third time as a charm program. Our speaker today was originally scheduled for February, and we had a power failure at the uh, Tyler History Center, and then we rescheduled her for April, and of course, coronavirus, COVID-19 hit, but today it's going to happen, and we're so very happy for that, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Stacy Adger is a lifelong resident of the Briar Hill section of Youngstown, with a passion for seeing her neighborhood and city flourish. She is currently employed as a dispatcher at the Youngstown State University Police Department. Stacy is a 1988 graduate of YSU with a Bachelor of Arts degree in speech communications with a telecommunications influence and a minor in marketing and public relations. Her first job in broadcasting came at WYSU FM, the university's public broadcasting station as a student engineer and announcer. Stacy currently sits on the station's Community Advisory Board. She spent 16 years in commercial television and radio, working at WYTV, WBBW Oldies 93, and briefly at WGAR in Cleveland. She also wrote feature articles for the newspapers and education section of The Vindicator and The Metro Monthly. In 2000, Stacy changed her career and followed one of her passions into law enforcement. She was a former Mahoning County Sheriff Reserve Deputy and former officer with the Youngstown State University Police Department and the Youngstown Police Department. She has been active in her community for decades. Stacy is currently on the board of the Alzheimer Network, a member of the Donald Lockett Post of VFW 6488 Auxiliary, and has been a volunteer at the rescue mission of the Mahoning Valley for over 30 years. Stacy has currently taken on another passion, genealogy, and is approaching that with her usual zeal. She is a trustee of the Ohio Genealogical Society and a past president of the Mahoning County chapter of the Ohio Genealogical Society, and she has done public speaking surrounding her family's history, which dates back more than 140 years here in the city of Youngstown. So it is with great pleasure I introduce today's speaker and the friend of the Mahoning Valley Historical Society, Stacy Adger, who will present What Brought Them Here? African American Migrations into the Mahoning Valley. Long before Mahoning became a county in 1846 and Youngstown became a village in 1848, and even before the city of Youngstown was chartered in 1867, you had African Americans who made their way into the valley via the Underground Railroad. There were numerous routes which wound their way in and near the area from Salem, East Liverpool, and even Western Pennsylvania as runaways moved further north with the aid of conductors and other helpers towards freedom. There was actually a route which had conductors who lived on the corners of Federal and Watts, Boardman and Phelps, Front and Hazel. And that route actually wound its way northeast towards Crab Creek and then northward. Recently, while working on a presentation dealing with the Underground Railroad, I heard the story of a woman named Aunt Jane Titus Thompson. She was a runaway who came into Canfield around 1822, according to an obit reprinted in the Mahoning Dispatch newspaper from a section of Virginia, which would eventually 
be morphed into West Virginia. She eventually settled in Warren, and pretty much everyone in the region knew she was a runaway. By the way, the term aunt was simply a title conferred on older black female slaves. While we're still trying to piece together her story, what we've been learning about her is fascinating. One of her sons, Charles Titus, enlisted in and fought as part of Company F, 5th USCT Infantry, and he was killed while fighting for the Union during the Civil War at New Market in Virginia, September 29, 1864. Not every person that came to Youngstown was a runaway. You have Melinda Anderson Knight, born free in Somerset, Perry County, Ohio, June 2, 1825. She came to the area with her husband, Daniel. They show up on the 1850 census in Bloomfield, Trumbull County, but a short time later, Melinda is living in Youngstown on West Boardman Street and is listed as a laundress and divorced from her husband by 1880. When she died, December 22nd, 1917, she lived on Garfield Street on the south side. The image here is actually one of her granddaughters. There was already a growing African-American presence here in the region. The Painesville Telegraph mentions an August 2nd, 1852 celebration marking the implementation of the 1807 Slave Trade Act, which ended the importation of enslaved Africans to British colonies, and then also the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act, which formally ended slavery in the British territories. There was a large celebration at Webb Hall in Warren in August of 1866, according to the Western Reserve Chronicle newspaper, one of many which celebrations were held over the years. That year, the featured speaker was abolitionist, attorney, and congressman John Mercer Langston. In some of the stories about gatherings, you'll find where Trumbull and Mahoney County African-American residents would interact on a regular basis. This article, seen here, mentions a festival that was on Mill Street, which is currently Oak Hill Avenue, for the AME Church, that was to celebrate the construction of their first church edifice. So immediately after the Civil War, the Youngstown area begins to receive an influx of new African-American residents, more from the Carolinas, Virginia, and Maryland. The abundance of coal, iron ore, which eventually led to the development of steel, helped the region grow and that helped attract people of all races to the valley as well. In Youngstown, the colored AME church, currently known as St. Andrews, began in 1869 and included many of the early black families. The first meetings were in the home of Civil War veteran and pioneer resident Oscar D. Bogus. As they grew, they moved out of private residences and into the old Excelsior Hall and then eventually the Town Hall building before moving into their own church home. This image is the second edifice the growing church had. They had moved into the recently demolished building on Rand Avenue in more recent years before moving into their current edifice on West Earl Street on the city's south side. There were also some black Baptists in the area around that same time who were unorganized. Right around 1871, research dug up by Ben LaRisha and Joe Tugarone for their book, Coal War in the Mahoney Valley, found ads in Virginia newspapers promising newly freed blacks from mining areas of Virginia employment, gardens, and housing in the valley. What they did not tell them was that they would be hired as black legs or strike breakers. It was in this group that my great-great-grandfather, Pleasant Tucker, came to the area, and an effort was made to organize the Baptist congregation. They met in private houses, as did the AME church, and then the town hall, and then Diamond Hall, and eventually the Sunday school rooms of the First Baptist Church building, which is currently encased 
in the Huntington Bank Building, which sits across from the Mahoney County Courthouse in downtown Youngstown. This is an image of the third structure that the congregation occupied, which was torn down when Interstate 680 was being constructed. Third Baptist on Park Hill Drive on the south side. With the reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow era laws embracing segregation, and an increase in lynchings in several southern states. Then the heavy losses in the cotton industry due to the bull weevil. Those blacks that could moved out of the deep south and began heading north. Prior to 1910, there were under 2,000 black city residents who bought their skills and talents with them. Masons, barbers, seamstresses, cooks, and those with other skills began moving into the city and in some cases setting up establishments to support their families. At the close of the first decade of the 1900s, the nation was on the precipice of the Great Migration. Many of us are familiar with the names of like Brick Mason, Lemuel Stewart, and also P. Ross Berry. P. Ross Berry was responsible for the design and construction of the Rand School building on Wick Avenue, the old Opera House, the Newcastle Courthouse in Lawrence County, Pennsylvania, and several other edifices. While some of these talented craftsmen put down roots here and made the valley home, others moved on to other areas of the country. If you have ever looked up at the Mahoning County Courthouse, and you will see the words, a nation cannot outlive justice where law ends and tyranny begins. Well, that was engraved by Julius T. Roberts. He was a skillful and much sought after marble mason and stone cutter. He was called in to cut the 13 inch high letters into the granite panel. After completing that assignment here in December of 1910, he left for Jackson, Michigan to work on a new courthouse there. That was eventually his final resting place. Now, according to census records, census and other records, some five million Americans left areas of the South where their families had been and moved into the Midwest, Northeast and West between 1915 and 1960, looking for increased opportunities. The relocation did not come without its pains. Many businesses were slow to place blacks into well-paying positions, and instead they would, employ them, they would employ them as chauffeurs, groundskeepers, cooks, maids, and janitors. Integration into steel mills and other large manufacturers in the area after the coal industry waned was slow, with blacks often left to take menial, low-paying jobs working in some of the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs in mills and factories. Black-owned businesses such as hotels, eateries, beauty, and barber shops had already begun to spring up in compartmentalized areas of the city. So much so that in the September 11th, 1915 edition of the Indianapolis-based Indiana Freeman newspaper, they did a complete two-page spread on the thriving Youngstown area and the blacks that live there. The section featured prominent blacks in business, the clergy, and in other areas of the economy. In the 1920s in Youngstown, you saw the rise of the Klan with their anti-black, anti-Italian, anti-immigrant sentiments, which impacted the lives of blacks in varying degrees. One of Youngstown's prominent businessmen, F.F. F. Armstrong, operated his haberdashery at 424 West Federal Street, near where the main fire station now stands. Called from interviews and also his son's writings, the late Dr. Herbert Armstrong, he recalls that the shop, quote, became a particular target of the Klan, being the first black-owned business of its type in the city. The increased activity and presence eventually ran patrons away forcing the building to close in 1926. 
As early as the 1880s, I've run across articles, several articles, which African Americans met in mass to address issues of disenfranchisement, racial segregation, and other issues, which would later become focal points for W.E.B. Du Bois and the 1905 start of the Niagara Movement. Blacks in the area also formed groups which provided instruction and insistence to those in the communities. Groups like the Roberts Deliberating Club, the Sharon Lyons Mothers Club, the Colored Y, and a growing number of churches and other organizations helped to support families in a number of ways and provided an important networking opportunity. This type of community self-help, self-sufficiency effort would become vital during and after the 1929 stock market crash. Thinking back to my Thomas family, they were like many others who did what they had to do to survive. Reverend Robert Leslie Thomas was born to newly freed slave parents in 1868, Virginia, and graduated from Wayland College and became a minister. After several appointments, he was named pastor of Third Baptist Church here in Youngstown in 1902. But when his young wife died suddenly in 1904, leaving him with three young children, he married the daughter of the founder of Third Baptist. I remember how struck I was the first time I looked at the 1930 census for Youngstown. Families lost homes and absorbed struggling family members during those rough times. The home on St. Louis Avenue that Reverend Thomas and his sons from his first marriage built has since been torn down within the past three years. But this image represents four separate families living under the same roof. Like many families throughout the city and the country, you did what you could do to support one another during the lean times because even when it was dark and there seemed to be no way, there was always hope, faith, and determination to strive for a better day. It was that faith that sustained us in spite of. As African Americans started making their way into politics and business in the city, there was still that reminder that no matter what strides you made, you would always encounter resistance. Even though Youngstown was north of the Mason-Dixon line, there were reminders here and in other northern cities that were invisible lines you simply could not cross. I remember my mother and others, elders, saying that they could only sit in the balconies in some of the movie halls after entering a building through a separate door, and that's here in this area, or attend certain schools when they were growing up here. There were others who, in spite of what had been the status quo, often worked to push the boundaries, often at great personal peril. Nathaniel Lee, seen here in a photo with one of the Dunbar Corral groups, also led the NAACP. It was his efforts and those of others seeking to integrate local swimming pools in the area that led to news stories that were picked up by media across the country. The effort on June 23, 1949, to integrate the Lincoln Park swimming pool forced the closing of the pool after Lee was told to take his children and leave the pool or watch his children drown. He fought racial inequality on several fronts, which included employment and law enforcement. Even printed news coverage in the city was somewhat segregated from the loyal legion of labor to the interesting local news notes for local colored folks to the CCC to Burns Harvey's columns, you knew where to look for local social news pertaining to the black community. This exclusionary treatment eventually led to the creation of a short-lived black newspaper in the 1930s and eventually the Buckeye Review which originated with McCullough Williams and continues today. The practice of redlining in the city was something black families looking to move into certain areas of the city were confronted with on a regular basis. It wasn't until 1968 that the Fair Housing Act was passed 
to fight that practice. But many of us know it continued long after that in one form or another. Then you had the impact of urban renewal, which often wiped out many minority communities. In closing, I think it's human nature to look for something better, to strive to carve out a place for yourself and your family with the goal of succeeding. We hope that through our labors, we leave something for our children to build upon. Although with many families struggling to find enough extra income to set aside to have a nest egg to fall back on, it's become exceedingly difficult for many of our brothers and sisters to make ends meet, let alone store something away. It's ironic that when this was recorded, the COVID-19 pandemic was underscoring the socioeconomic disparities, not only here, but across the country. As I was preparing this presentation, it struck me how time impacts one's understandings of events, which seem like they happened so long ago, when in reality, it wasn't that long ago. For example, when JFK was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963, I was on my way. Malcolm X, February 21st, 1965, I was only 11 months old. Martin Luther King Jr., April 4th, 1968, I was just under four. When Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, I was four. For some of you, your memories of those times impacted you deeply and helped forge the person you have become today. However, it's important to remember that we have so many 50-somethings who have little or no understanding of the significance of the names I just mentioned and of those of so many others who came before us and did what they could to make an impact, not only here, but across the valley and beyond. If you're brave enough, I encourage you to engage someone 30 or younger about what they know about some of the figures that you were talking about when you were their age. If you were lucky, you will find someone who knows something about one or two of the names that you mentioned. But once you get to the 20 and under crowd, you may find, may likely find that the collective group of movers and shakers that we recall holds no significance for them whatsoever. In the meantime, we have several other programs you might want to check out online and on our social media pages. We have the MVHS Artifact series on our Facebook page, on Time Capsule, which is a blog post section of our website, mahoninghistory.org. Uh, tomorrow you'll see a new installation about Juneteenth, which is a special anniversary and commemoration date in the African American community. And we're starting Hands On History at your house. This will be every week in July where we'll have a new program that you can undertake from home and we hope you participate in these very popular and very interesting programs. <laughs>